And welcome to our community. Susie Thomas here with you this morning, visiting with Char Lotzenheiser, who is the director of the Canton Classic Car Museum. Char, welcome. Oh, Susie, thanks so much. I'm so glad to be on your show. You know, we had an encore performance of you where we only got to chat with you for a few minutes. And so wanted to bring you back and uh, do this right. So we really appreciate your time today. Let's start with the building in which you are located. The Canton Class- Classic Car Museum building itself is a is a story in itself. Tell us a little bit about it. Oh, I'd be happy to. And and. It gives me a great pleasure to, to work here and to think about the history of this building. Uh, it was actually built in 1900 by a, a wealthy gal who was uh, building some structures, but uh, the origin of the building was two local men, George Monnet and Joseph Socker, uh, actually uh, had a bicycle business. And this is an interesting fact. Two blocks north of my building, and I will give you a little uh, direction as to where we're at. We're on the corner of Market Avenue and 6th Street Southwest across mm-hmm. from WHBC. So that'll get people, if they haven't been here, a little idea of where we are directly catty corner from, uh, from the Kent Repository. Mm-hmm. So two blocks north of me is uh, Ida Sachs to McKinley's Girlhood Home. Yes. And next to that was the Monnet and Soccer Bicycle Shop where they sold bicycles, repaired bicycles, and actually there was a Monnet bicycle built here in Canton. Never knew that. No, I know, and we've looked for one. I, I don't know that the McKinley Museum might have found one, but it's a really interesting story. So here we are, these two men doing all this bicycle, because pr- bicycles were the primary means of transportation. Obviously, most people had bicycles, not very many automobiles at that time period. So let's fast forward, and George Monnet decides to move to the location I'm at, which was the address was 555 Market Avenue South. The, the doors of the museum were on the front on Market. Uh, the, the car dealership was on the front on Market. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Awfully large area. If you've ever been to my building, it's over 22,000 square feet. It's a very large building, and it was originally two stories. So pretty large to build bicycles. Well, Mr. Monnet had a great idea. He actually charged people rent to store their cars here in Canton, Ohio. Not on days like today, but what we had previous weeks of that cold and blowing snow, you Mm -hmm. couldn't drive an open car, an open-air car. So he would charge you rent to store your car here. Very smart man. And, and people uh, didn't have garages no, then. No, no one had garages. You had little, maybe a lean-to of sorts, but yeah. just a, a little canopy-type covering, but no. So they would store them here, and he made an enormous amount of money. Now, the next segue of this is the perfect part. About 1912, there were two men that were starting these rumors. And, you know, people love rumors. And it was a man named Carl Fisher, who was the founder of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and mm-hmm. another gentleman named Henry B. Joy, who was the president of the Packard Motor Car Company. And on a side note... For those people that don't know, the Packard automobile was actually started in Warren, Ohio. And we can talk about the Packard brothers later. But So, a Warren, Ohio guy. They had started rumors that they were going to design the first coast-to-coast paved highway in the United States called the Lincoln Highway, also known as Route 30. Mm -hmm. And the interesting fact about this was that it was going to start in downtown New York City, come down through Canton, Ohio, also known as Tuscarawas, and as you continued on that road, you'd end up in Lincoln Park, San Francisco. The road is actually, Susie, 3,389 miles long. I mean, it's even hard to comprehend. It is. All laid by hand. So George, sitting in this building right here on the corner of Market Avenue and and, uh, 6th Street, said, wait a minute, if that road really does happen, they're going to be six blocks north of my building, and they're not going to be pedaling bicycles. They're going to be driving automobiles. Mm -hmm. So in 1914, George Monnet had the vision to turn this building into a a 24-hour-a-day service repair garage to service travelers on that Lincoln. How brilliant. What a visionary. Yes. Not only that, Susie, he went one step further. He had curbside service. Who did that in 1914? That's when the road went through. And one step beyond that, he wanted to sell automobiles, but he was smart enough not to use his working capital. So he wrote to Henry Ford and said, hey, Henry, want to sell those Model Ts but can't afford to buy them. What if I get all the parts and assemble them? And Henry agreed. Mm. Henry was a smart man. He yes. said, wait a minute, I get to sell things and not do any work and not pay people? Oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. So they <laughs> trained in the parts uh, down on 11th Street and then brought the parts and hoisted them to the second floor, assembled Model Ts, and then sold them out front uh, of the of the. Uh, the car dealership. The Monnet and Soccer, as this was known, was the largest Ford dealership in the country from 1914 till 1931. That is incredible. Isn't it incredible? It just gives me chills. I, I think sitting in my office some days, wonder what they did back here. Wonder oh, who yeah. stood here. Yeah. You know, um, there were so many great car dealerships in, in our area and so many really influential people and, and lots of money. And, you know, I just wonder who bought a car here? You know, wh- what were they doing? In fact, really neat. We have a, a photograph out and it's of the workers. I have to tell you on this, this great piece of history. I know you love history. Mm-hmm. A gentleman came to my office one day and said, I have a photograph for you. You'll probably want it. And it was a picture of the workers here in 
25 of oh. the Monnet in Soccer. My. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Oh, this is amazing. I've never seen it. Up yeah. close of George Monnet, Joseph Soccer. And he said, yes, my father worked here as a <gasps> salesman. I said, oh, are you kidding me? And he pointed it out to me. And then he said, and do you see this woman here? She became my mother. His oh, parents had met here. They met there. At this dealership. Oh, my goodness. Now, was that the first car dealership in the area? No, there were quite a few. They were all there? sort of opened up about the same time. Everyone mm-hmm. was sort of transitioning. The automobile was, uh, was on the horizon. The Model T, you know, all these cars uh, were, were up and coming, even cars that are long since gone. And so dealerships, uh, if you had the capital, were popping up all over. You know, there was a, a Studebaker. There was a Ford. There was a Hupmobile. You know, Ralph Hay, of course, we could talk about him on the corner of 2nd Street and Cleveland Avenue, which is where the contract of the NFL was signed, was right down the streets, and he was very good friends with George mm. Monnet here. They'd eat at Benders, and, you know, everyone sort of worked <laughs> together as a, as a community as a whole here yeah, in Canada. Yeah. Even though they were in competition with selling automobiles, it was still a camaraderie together of making this town what it was back then. That kind of describes the community, doesn't it? It does. It yes. does. So, <clears throat> just, I mean, it's riveting to think, I'm, you know, I, I try to picture, we've got pictures of the workers here, and, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, what were they doing back here? Were they doing, what were they doing? Yeah. I, I, it's just a, it's a great feeling to know oh. that, that a piece of history is still intact because, you know, we've lost so a lot and uh, it's nice to know that some things are still standing. You must feel like you time travel every single day as soon as you walk <laughs> into your office. It's just amazing the kinds of things you see. Uh, you And you know everything, Char. We're speaking with Char Lotzenheiser, who is the director of the Canton Classic Car Museum. Uh, the the knowledge that you have is amazing. Please answer this one for me. I've heard this rumor, and you can verify or not whether uh-huh. it's true. The first two cars in Ohio actually ran into each other? Well, there's all kinds of speculations, and they'll tell you <laughs> that it was a female that did it, too. So, you know. Um, is, is this true? Well, there were car accidents, and, and I don't know. The first traffic light was in Cleveland. I do yeah, know that. knew for that. A, for a fact. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're only, our knowledge is cars. You always have that discrepancy because, you know, people say this was And we only know as much as what's written, and it depends on who writes it. Yes. Uh, so there, was, there were a couple car accidents, and one of them was in Ohio. Um, that was before the traffic light. And, and they do say it was a rumor. And, you know, uh, there's just all kinds of rumors about cars. You can talk about the first automobile. We have cars dating back you know, 1805. Mm. Uh, the first uh, steam engine was actually invented by Nicholas Cuno in 1760 in Paris. So, wow. you know, when you talk about the first cars, a lot of people think it's synonymous with Henry Ford. And, and there are so many men, and I say men not to, for anything other than that, that's what it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are so many cars. Uh, you know, there were, between 1805 and 1942, Susie, there were 546 cars built in Ohio, and seven of them were built in Canton. Oh, so, my and, and, goodness. And, and, of course, you know, none that we'd hear of. Yeah, right. we do have one here that was built here in Canton called the Holmes, actually built over on Winfield Way off of, well, that would be Mahoning Road or 153 uh, in the northeast end of Canton. That's what's so amazing, because at that time when all the innovations and inventions were taking place and you have so many different cars, as you say, we've never heard of these. I just recently got to see a Tucker. I had never oh, seen one. I've never close. seen a Tucker. I have a oh. friend that has two of them. Oh, my goodness. That, a little yeah. plug for her. She has a museum in Huntington, Pennsylvania. A little Very plug for cool. Pat Swigert, yes. Well, and like you say, we associate, eventually it, it whittled down to the big three. Yeah, um, and, how and did it's, that happen? it's a shame. Um, and, and I will tell you, you know, there's been over 5,000 different makes of American automobiles in the last hundred years. Mm. And with that being said, there's a lot of, there's reason, uh, a lot of car guys that built a car, started manufacturing a car, would... Um, lose their shirt. Uh, it took $100,000 of working capital in 1900 to start an automobile company. That's a lot of money. I yeah. don't know what the, the cash equation is to that, the monetary equation, but it's a lot of money. And so a lot of times they wouldn't make it the first time, and then they'd restructure, reformat, and come back with a new name. Well, we've got one here, George Doris. He had the Doris automobile in 1887. Mm. 1897, I apologize. And then it didn't work out for him. By 1904, he had restructured into the St. Louis Motor Car Carriage Company. And that did better? It did better. In fact, he hooked up with, with a man named Mr. Henry, I mean, Mr. Mr. Henry Timken. Oh, okay. So it has Timken wow. roller bearings on it. Oh, my. So a lot of times there, you can look at cars and look at the origins, and some of these men had two and three cars, not just one. So it wow. was the same man, but with a lot. Like, Canton had the Altman steam, you know, mm-hmm. Cornelius Altman, first plow company, one of the largest plow companies in the world, not just the country, the world, which is right down the street from us, also, you know, connected to the Hercules building. Um, right. You know, we had another car uh, here in Canton. Obviously, I told you the whole, it was called the Burger. Mm-hmm. We had one called the Blackston. We had one called the Canton. We had the Holmes. 
one interesting, here's another fact. We had the Keller Electric, which obviously was an electric car, but here's one called the Hydro Car. Have you ever heard of that? No. Well, I'm going to give George Monnet, the man that has this building, a huge accolades, brilliant man. In 1917, when most people didn't drive, and people didn't have a lot of automobiles at that time, you know, um, Mr. Monnet, in this building somewhere, and it, that's the part of the riveting part for me of thinking, where did he design? Where was his office? Where did all these great thoughts come from? Yes. He designed an amphibious car, a, bo- a boat car in 1917. In 1917? Now, most of you, you've probably heard of the Ducks, correct? Yes. In Pittsburgh, World War II, right? Most people think that's the first amphibious car. Right. Well, in 1917, in this building, George Monnet designed the hydro car. And we've got one photograph of it taken right outside the building on market, and then one of the pictures, the next one, is taken in Myers Lake. Oh, my. Now, how, in, just brilliant. I, yeah. I think about the concept when driving was relatively new, let alone something that did both. Well, you know, the sky's the limit. When you're inventing things, why not it is. find a car that can be a boat? Right, and he took it to uh, D.C. to use during World War I, and they took it out on the Potomac, and unfortunately, that war came to, I, I guess, unfortunately, it's a, sort of a catch-22 Fortunately, unfortunately for Mr. Monnet, uh, it was coming to an end. And they said, way to go. But, you know, we think this thing's going to stop. Maybe for the next war we'll use it. Well, obviously that didn't happen. Well, And so then what happened? Because then you know, that kind of went by the wayside. And did. then eventually somebody invented it again. They did. But, uh, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, you put all your eggs in one basket monetarily. Mm-hmm. And who knows the kind of monies that he had cash out laying for that. The Depression hit in 29. Right. Um, a lot of people were strapped. A lot of people lost everything. So the working capital to actually... to continue with that momentum or to start from scratch wasn't there and you could never serve you couldn't survive that now i'm trying to absorb all this and i'm writing sorry. fast so i'm sorry <laughs> as you, i could just let talk me endlessly and it's all fascinating let me circle back because i think i heard you say electric car aren't they just inventing those now oh no 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 baker electrics were invented in cleveland ohio yes how long yeah. ago uh let's see let me let me think here. You put me on the spot. Oh no, I'm sorry. Well, that's but a okay. Long time I, I have ago. a lot of I have a lot of recall because from the time I was a little girl, all I did is memorize car facts. In fact, I would take Motor Trend magazine with my dad, and my mom would give us quizzes. Now tell me that's not funny. That's amazing. Yeah, that's they, how you know so much. Well, it's a, you know it's a passion, and my you know kids mm-hmm. uh, people ask you are your, are your kids or your husband into cars, and and my children's response is nobody's in cars as much as our mom. <laughs> so it's not like they're not into cars, but. Uh, and, of course, I married a man who isn't a car enthusiast. Isn't that just figure? That's but hilarious. But but you're the perfect person to be the director of the Canton Classic Car Museum. Well, I'm, I'm blessed to be the director is what oh, it says. So but cool. uh, Baker Electric, let me, I think mm-hmm. we're talking late 1800s, 1899. So, so electric cars have been around that long. Oh, absolutely. So absolutely. why are we just now being encouraged to buy them? Well, you know, it's just people thought it was a better idea. Um, you know, there were pros and cons. The same like steam cars, you know, mm-hmm. the Dolby Steam and the white you know, they're very efficient. They run on water and kerosene. Uh, they get great gas mileage. They're, they're big. They're big automobiles. But, you know, we could be still doing that. Uh, there's always a new idea. You know? Just amazing. All right. You did say, remind me to tell you about the Packard Brothers, so I'm not going to let you get away with that. All right. Oh, the Packard Brothers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, since that's one of our Ohio built cars that, that became very iconic and, yes. and made a huge impact in the automotive industry. The Packard Brothers were from Warren, Ohio, and uh, they never wanted to be car guys. <laughs> Their dream in life was to be electricians. And in order to become an electrician um, from Warren, Ohio, they needed to get to New York City. In order to get there, needed a reliable automobile. And at that time period, uh, one of the most reliable automobiles was a Winton built by Alexander Winton from Cleveland, Ohio. And so the course of them going back and forth in their Winton from uh, Warren to, uh, to New York, um, mm-hmm. the car didn't fare very well. And they got a little disgruntled, and so they contacted Mr. Winton, and I guess in a few short words, they, he said, if you don't like mine, build one of your own. And they did. And they did. In they built the Packard. 1899, the first Packard was built in <laughs> Warren, Ohio, until 1903, and then from wow. that point on, they moved to Detroit uh, and were until their bankruptcy in 1958. But so, who knew they were from Ohio yeah, first? Yeah, the Amazing. Packard Electric is still, yeah. you know, a very big industry, always was. And, yeah, they were, they just had some great ideas. So, you know, from that Things just kept branching off, and, you know, some great cars evolved from that. But lots of super – I mean, we could talk forever. It, there's no such thing as a new idea, and I say that over and over. Mm-hmm. I mean, here's a prime example. Um, we have uh, flower vases in the museum. 
Actually, they should be called vases, as expensive as they are. <laughs> and uh, they were putting automobiles in the back with leather or metal brackets and to put freshly cut flowers. And obviously, no heater or conditioning, mohair seats, no deodorants, uh, bathing, mm, an option. So uh, it really did help with the smell. Well, look at Volkswagen. Right. They came up with a little flower. Yes. Not a new idea. Uh, We have another car. If you uh, had seen uh, Lincoln Navigators uh, about 15 years ago, they had a little extra step because, you know, they're pretty high off the ground. They're uh, one of the bigger SUVs. And so if you have a a gal with a a a short skirt on, it's difficult. So through the magic of computer chips and electronics, you push a button, out comes a little extra step or a little extra mini running board, as far as I'm concerned, for thousands and thousands of dollars. Well, in 1916, we have a Pierce Arrow, and all you do is open the door, and there's a hinge to drop it oh, up. Oh, oh, Just amazing. Just ingenuity. No, and, there's, and, you know, people think integrated van seats. Not so much. The 16 Pierce Arrow, you just fold seats out from the back seat, and there's extra seats to sit. We really need to visit your museum I and figure so. out the better way, more efficient way to do these things. <laughs> the timer is screaming at me. Right. We need to take a break. All right. Um, we'll be back with more with uh, Char Lotzenheiser. She's director of the Canton Classic Car Museum. After these words, you're listening to our community.